We know, every one of us, that in the end all will be well. For God will care for us and give us victory and peace. And when peace comes, remember, it will be for us, the children of today, to make the world of tomorrow a better and happier place. You know, you think about the fact that this is a 14 year old girl whose father was not originally meant to be king. Uh, he was the brother of the king and he's thrust into the monarchy. And then that means that basically her life as being a normal little girl is over. Um, but she definitely seemed to enter that uh, era of her life uh, with quite a bit of poise for such a young girl. Can you talk a little bit about her and just her longevity and her ability to change and shift with the times? Do we have Ms. do we have Susanna Lipscomb? Okay, I don't think we have her. So I'm going to go to Dr. Shola on this. Because I think for a lot of Britons, this is the only queen they've ever known. And we're talking about people your age, your grand your mother's age and your grandmother's age probably. You know, for most Britons from, you know, my family they were even over there. This is the only queen they've ever known. She was able to adapt. She did prove to be remarkably adaptable. Well, I suppose the first thing I'll say is, well, I think a lot of people, yes, are right now paying their respects um, at the lo longest reigning monarch of the United Kingdom. And people, she, she meant different things to different people. I would question whether or not um, the monarchy was able to adapt, because I, I would say that in the last number of years, and I don't mean last few years, I think there would be a question about whether or not they did adapt, because there were many cases where people felt that they were out of touch, right? Um, what she did stand for, I think, and what she represented was um, was a system and a protocol and a way of the way things are and have always been. And I think from that perspective, people saw her as as a leader in that light, as somebody they could rely on, you know, with the stiff upper lip and, you, you know, the, the, the queen is never changing. So I would not necessarily agree that she was adaptable, so to speak. I mean, there's so many different examples of where people felt that the, the royal family was out of touch. You know, it, it, I, I said that because when Diana came along, I think for a lot of Americans who are, you know, very much obsessed with it, and for whatever reason, these colonies or this country are very obsessed with the royal family, especially with Diana, who was this very, very different kind of royal who, you know, reached out to patients with AIDS and young children and would touch people without gloves on, people who were black and brown and around the world, and was just different. And the royal family had to adapt to her, and it was wrenching for them to do it, but they had to do it. And then when she died, the queen had to... For the public relations of it was so difficult that she really had to embrace her in death in a way that I think was difficult. And then you talk about Camilla, I mean, who was involved in that whole thing, where they now yeah. had to accept the idea that a divorcee could actually be queen. I mean, so in that sense, all of the... I mean, there was a time when the Britons, you know, they were not sure that they could invite a divorced person to go to a state dinner. And now they have somebody who is a divorced woman who is married to the now crowned king. Oh, well, that's correct. But I would not, not say that the royal family, I would not say that the royal family adapted to Princess Diana because, quite frankly, the opposite is true. Because if yeah. they had, then when she passed away, it was because of the outrage of the public in not seeing any demonstration of affection or sorrow from the royal family that forced the queen and the royal family to come out. Uh, and uh, Princess Diana was a whole different, a whole different human being from uh, from the Queen and from members of the royal family. What you saw with Chris, Princess Diana was somebody that was relatable. You you kind of felt Princess Diana was your sister, your friend, and she was, um, you know, she showed emotion. You didn't really get that with the Queen. The Queen was very much, you know, arm's length. I think people romanticized her as you would, say, a grandmother. But the institution that is the monarchy was very much at as as an arm's length from the public. So I would not say it's the same thing. I think that, yes, you're right, that circumstances of the modern world um, forced them to have to take a step back and go, OK, look, we can't carry on with you can't marry a, you know, a, a divorced person, right? They had to right. make changes, especially what happened with Princess Margaret, um, and, and they had different stories. So with Charles, who had 
I would say, I mean, to be fair to him, he had borne the, the decision of his parents to marry somebody other than the person he really wanted to marry. I, yeah. I think it made sense at the end of the day for them to go, OK, we, we've tried and um, that didn't work out. OK, marry who you want to marry. But I would not say they adapted as such, because then you have Meghan Markle, which is a perfect right. example again of how the has not adapted at all. Yeah, and I do think we do now have uh, Susanna Lipscomb, because I want you to weigh in on this, because they, it does seem that Queen Elizabeth, the late Queen Elizabeth, she did occupy this very unique space, and that she was doing what all the previous monarchs had done, but doing it on television, uh, and on, at first on the radio and then on television, and sort of living, it was a much more public royal family, if, if, if I may say, more accessible, because you could see their lives, and you could see them as a family. Do you think that that has changed um, to Dr. Shola's point, the way that the institution evolved. Yes, uh, and I'm so sorry for leaving you hanging earlier there, Joy. I think that's absolutely part of it because, of course, we know that hers was the first televised coronation. Um, half the adult population of Britain watched it, even though there were only two and a half million TV sets in the country at the time, um, and then went on to choose to have her Christmas messages broadcast from 1957. Um, and so that meant that each year there was an opportunity, how, albeit packaged in a, in a quite a formal way, to get some sense of who she was, her values were. I mean, it's it, interesting if you want to know something about the Queen, you need to look back at those Christmas messages. She often talked about her Christian faith. She was invariably positive. She often talked about hope. I mean, there was a wonderful little instance where there was one speech uh, where she chatted with the royal children about the name of one of her corgis called Dash. And she says, you know, the word you say when you're cross. <laughs> and I think also with the film from 1969, which gave an insight into their domestic lives as a royal family, which was watched by more people than watched man landing on the moon, there was an opportunity to see behind the veil. But at the same time, um, television was often unkind to them. There were parody they were parodied in the show um, in the 1980s. We've seen more recently films like The Queen and the series The Crown. And she's never had a sort of right of rebuttal. She was never able to say anything in her defence. Um, and, and we've also most recently seen her humour, as we did, of course, at the Platinum Jubilee, with the scene with Paddington and pulling the sandwich out of her handbag. So I think that television has given us an insight into her life at the same time as allowing her to be very publicly maligned. And, and indeed, and I just have to show this because it is sort of dramatic, the world um, that has that changed in the time that I, I really wish we had more time. This is the British Empire in 1945, um, when Elizabeth was crowned in 1952, Britain had a massive empire. It was more than 70s overseas territories. And then by 2015, you can see the reduction in just the, scape, the scope and size to almost nothing. Um, and I wonder how you feel about her having to preside over that massive change in what the British Empire was. I think this is why we have to accept that um, the Queen means different things to different people, OK? And this is important to note. Now, and just as you mentioned earlier, Joy, that because of the time she came into, uh, became a queen, she came and she became queen of the British Empire. And the British Empire was a, a colonizing empire, which made her a colonizer queen, right? Just as right now, she's revered as, um, as a global leader because she's the head of state of the United Kingdom, which is recognized as a global power. And I think two things can be true. And in the, it, the, the part of a legacy, is that colonization, it is the atrocities that were committed in the name of Queen or country during the colonizing period. And, um, and yes, many countries fought hard. Many of them, many lives were lost, people imprisoned, even tortured, um, in order to be set free from, from Britain's um, colonization, so to speak. And she was the queen during that time. So for, for a number of people, while people are trying to be respectful of her passing, because I'm respectful of her passing, I can respect 
her sense of duty. But what I cannot do is to look at her legacy through rose-tinted glasses. And I don't think that would be right to do. Um, I, I don't think that would make any sense. It's definitely not consistent with who I am. I think that in order for us to fully e encapsulate a legacy, it is important for us to understand the history, the legacy, what she what she did, what she did not do, what she failed to do. So for a lot of people, if she like me, if she had led by being vocally visible against racial injustice and inequality in Britain and, ad and addressed both historical and present-day systemic racism, she would have had a lot of legitimacy and credibility in a number of nations, including those that still have her head of state, moving her as head of state. Mm -hmm. So I think this is all part of it. Let me give uh, Ms. Lipscomb the last word on this. What do you think overall, given how complex the legacy of the crown is, uh, that her legacy will ultimately be? Well, I absolutely respect what's being said about the British Empire and, the, and colonization. I think, though, that actually, if we were to really look to what the Queen's legacy has been, it's been the creation of the Commonwealth, which has been an, an institution that has been about people being equal and about creating alliances and uh, professional so professional associations. And I think that she has, it's the Commonwealth, in fact, that has, that, that spoke out against, um, for example, apartheid um, or um, challenged a number of sort of practices in the 1970s, but particularly yep. that were uh, ones that were negative towards um uh, people of colour, and I, so I feel like that actually the Commonwealth has been a, uh, an institution for good. And if we if we were to put her name to anything, it's been presiding over the the decolonisation, the post imperial world, and that was the institution of which she was most proud. And it wouldn't have got off the ground without her.